This podcast is brought to you by Audible. Have you been wanting to read more, but don't seem to have the time? Well, with Audible, you can read your books without having to find the extra time in your busy schedule. Stuck in traffic on your way home from work? Why not marathon the Harry Potter books? In the gym and want to learn about the First Lady? Well, you can listen to Becoming Michelle Obama while doing Leg Day. And if you go to audibletrial.com slash cultivate, you get a month free of Audible. That includes one credit that you can trade in for any audiobook of your choice, access to thousands of audiobooks free to listen to with your account, and best of all, you have access to all of your favorite podcasts in the app as well. So be sure to go to my link, audibletrial.com slash cultivate, that's C-U-L-T-I-V, the number eight, to sign up for a free month of Audible and start reading today. Thank you, Audible, for supporting the show. We are. We are. We are Cultivate. 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 We are Cultivate. Hello and welcome to a special mini-sode of Yield Crime, the show where Maddie and I discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear every Wednesday. This special bi-weekly segment is called Can You Crack the Cramp Word, which is slang for a difficult or obscure term, which I thought was very fitting. And joining me today are the lovely ladies from Homespun Hates, Becky and Diana, And before we begin, I'd like to give them the opportunity to tell us a little more about themselves and their show before we start the game. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay, for having us. This is, uh, we're really looking forward to this. I'm sure that we're (laughs) going to, well, (laughs) I'll probably bomb significantly, but I'm going to enjoy myself the same. (laughs) I don't think the point is to be right, is it? No, the point is to just have a good time. Well, We'll that we will do. Yes. Um, (laughs) So I, I'm Becky. I am one of the co-hosts of Homespun Hates, which is a podcast dedicated to the oral tradition of scary stories. And what we do is every week, well, every episode, we feature another guest who has encountered a ghost. And we bring them on the show and we have them tell about it. And we usually begin the show with some very inappropriate banter. And <laughs> <laughs> So if you hate comedy and spooky things, don't listen to it, please. No, exactly. <laughs> but, but our goal is to scare the hell out of each other and our audience, all while having a great time, and dig deep into the high strange of the ghostly world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm Diana of Homespun Haints as well, and I couldn't have said it better myself, Becky. Oh, thank you, Diana. <laughs> yeah, that was a really good synopsis. Kudos. Oh, well, thank you. I came up with that on the spot. It's <laughs> Professional. <laughs> All right. Well, I have some questions for you ladies, just so we can kind of get to know you guys a little bit better. Okay. So I'll start with you, Becky. According to your website, because yes, I went on your website. <laughs> you grew up in Appalachia. Appalachia. Yes. Appalachia. I, I meant to say Appalachia. Let- you That's were like okay. the closest anybody's ever been. Yeah, most people <laughs> really? say Appalachia, and I'm like, yay! <laughs> what are we, French? <laughs> we're hill people. We're not nearly that fancy. <laughs> hill people. <laughs> hill people. <laughs> we have eyes. <laughs> All seven of them, yes. <laughs> so what sorts of paranormal stories or experiences did you have kind of growing up there before you moved to Atlanta? Oh my gosh, where to begin? Well, uh, everybody I knew had a ghost story. It was just part of part of life. I had an imaginary friend who was a 20-something, I think somebody who died in a war, 20-something man with some strange issues. He had a lot of anger management issues and he would pace around. He was only aware of me half of the time. I would see things in the hallway of my house. I would play with strange children that apparently didn't exist (laughs) on the hills and the forest and things like that. My mother also is very sensitive. She would see strange balls of light in the woods and often see strange people on the side of the road that nobody else could see. 
things of that nature. We had a house at the end of our hill that we lived on that was very well known to be haunted by cat ghosts. You'd come Ooh. in and you'd sit down and you'd feel a warm lump on your lap after you sat for a while. This is just sort of the things that I grew up with. Everybody had a ghost story. Every teacher had a ghost story. My violin teacher had a ghost story. It was just it was just one of those things that I loved it. I loved it so much. Just part of every, everyday life, just someone. Had, it was. It wasn't it was, out of the yes. norm. It was a, uh -huh. a normal yeah. everyday thing. Yes. Tell me your ghost story. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> All right. So, Diana, first of all, I love your description of your parents on the website, like the, the Vulcan mathematician and the, <laughs> the fairy. <laughs> It holds true to everybody who knows them. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Accurate. Yeah. And that, you know, you have like a, a healthy dose of skepticism. I think that's fair to say when it comes to the paranormal. But you also said that your basement is haunted. So can you <laughs> tell us a little more about that? Wait till I tell you about my teleportation experiences. Um, so, yes, I... Uh, Unlike Becky's childhood, I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, an area where a lot of people will just their only response to what's your ghost story is I'll pray for you. <laughs> so I didn't really have the exact same warm lump experience that Becky had in her childhood. However, I grew up in the weird family. My, you know, like, like I said, on the on the uh, website, my dad's a mathematician probably doesn't believe in the paranormal, but wouldn't even waste time talking about it mm -hmm. to express an opinion. And my mom is like, you know, reading the secret and the Celestine prophecy and things like that. And she's total like Reiki certified and energy healer. She does reflexology. So it it's just a, I was, I was definitely the weird kid out of everybody else being just a, you know, normal corn fed Christian family. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom taught me my alphabet on a Ouija board when I was growing <laughs> up. And so <laughs> there's an awesome. antique Ouija board from the seventies. So it just kind of, you know, yeah. it, it was a part Ouija of day to day board. life, <laughs> not just any Ouija board, like one of the original, <laughs> not one of the Milton Bradley's, <laughs> but like <laughs> it was, it was, it was, it was just normal to me growing up to embrace strange occult beliefs mm -hmm. equally to any other tradition or religion or whatever. So, yeah, I, I, but at the same time, whenever I went down my basement stairs in the house that I grew up in, I would feel as I came back up the stairs, I would feel what felt like fingers grasping at my long hair and the back of my shirt. And so I learned very early on in life to rush up the last two stairs, run up the stairs and when I was sleeping down there as a teenager, as we do, mm -hmm. the uh, the dreams that I would have would just be bizarre phenomena about, you know, view viewing myself from the other room in oh, my dream, creepy. viewing myself sleeping. Yeah, a little bit. And then uh, I moved back into the house as an adult and recently had an experience where I was getting a scarf out of the washing machine and, of course, you don't put a scarf in the dryer. That'd just be foolish. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a decorative dressy scarf, nice chiffon. So I hung it up on a clothesline that was between me and the rest of the basement. And as I'm lifting it up and floofing it out on top of the clothesline, I bring it down and I look down at the floor and I see a pair of feet. Ooh. Dirty, bare, pale feet. And I whip beside the scarf and there's nothing there. Ooh. Nobody. So, yeah, that was the first time I've actually seen, not just dreamed about somebody, but multiple psychic mediums have either had dreams or visions of this thing while they're talking to me while we're recording on this podcast. And they're again. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so sometime this, this year or next year, whenever, Becky's going to come help me investigate the basement and we're going to find out what's really going on there because... As you said, I still have a healthy dose of skepticism, so I'm still hoping it's just all in my head, right? Possibly. Yeah. It's a hill person. Maybe. <laughs> they were like, this is a nice basement. You got a nice basement. <laughs> it actually is a really nice basement. I mean, I lived down there for over a year, so it's a nice basement. But yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, the feet part is terrifying. Like, 
It was. I mean, feet are gross enough as it is, but then <laughs> to have that be like the only like appendage you see. Ugh. All right. Yeah. <laughs> no thanks. Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. It was just I'm... for a brief, teeny, teeny millisecond before oh I gosh. freaked out and whipped aside the scarf and everything disappeared. Can I tell you how jealous I am? I mean, that's amazing. Oh, I wish I would see a ghost in my house. I wish I could see some disembodied feet. God, I know. I only, I only feel and hear them. They don't, they don't, they don't show themselves to me anymore. Well, I wish I could co- convince myself I was hallucinating. So I guess we're even. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to you, Becky. So, all right, people may not know that you paint original artwork for your episodes. Yes, I did. Mm-hmm. So what have been some of your favorite painting subjects so far? Or do you have any? It's hard to you know, pick really, when it comes to your babies. <laughs> <laughs> I really like any sort of architecture. Anytime I can draw or paint a, a haunted house, or I recently did a, a, an abandoned trailer from the 60s. Ooh. Yeah, I just, I just love architecture because when I, when I paint, I don't really try to get my perspective right or my shadows right. I feel like if I did that exactly, it would almost remove some of the um, the quirkiness and the, the spookiness mm-hmm. from the paintings themselves. So I, you know, it's, it's somewhat correct. Like I know how to do it, but I don't, I don't put too much effort into it. Mm-hmm. So I just kind of guesstimate and that gives it that extra little weirdness and architectural drawings give me the opportunity to kind of, you know, put some wrong angles in or quirkiness mm-hmm. here, things that you're not going to expect, but just kind of give it character. But then it also makes you feel a little off mm-hmm. when you look at it. So yeah, like something's just a little not right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Cool. <laughs> like a micro dose of Escher. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. She, she designed the shirt I'm wearing. Whoa. Oh, nice. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Fun, quirky houses. So, Diana, you love to travel. What are some of your favorite places that you've been to? Oh, number one is China. (laughs) Definitely China, like anywhere in China. But I've never been to a nice, like, tourist place in China. I always end up going with students for some kind of program of some sort. And so I end up in, like, these strange backwater places, no... No American that I talked to is like, oh, did you go to Beijing? No. Did you go to Shanghai? No. Did you go to Taiwan? No. I went to Beihai. Where's that? It's in the middle of nowhere. (laughs) You can kind of almost imagine that you can see Vietnam from the shore because it's down on the South Sea of China. And, you know, huge population. But I was kind of the first Westerner that many, 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 many people in the city had seen ever in person, not just on TV or magazines. And many Chinese women had to come up to me and touch my arm hair and laugh at me. I I was 14. It was, it was, it was the bomb. It was great. And then I went back to China when I was an adult and we went to Lanzhou, which is like, it's a university town, but it's, it's like the second most polluted city on the planet. Um, So people there will smoke cigarettes to filter the air that they oh breathe make it cleaner <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> exaggerating but it, it basically <laughs> seems that way you know they sell face masks long before face masks were cool mm-hmm. on the street corners you know with hello kitty on it so you don't have to breathe that nasty air and your your mask just turns black by the end of the day Ugh. but yeah so i've been to weird places in china and that was definitely my favorite nice okay <laughs> This last question is for both of you. Okay. So what sort of inspired you guys to start the podcast in part two? What has been the most terrifying story you've heard so far on the podcast? Well, the podcast was Becky's idea, so I'll let her answer this one. (laughs) (laughs) I was looking for a way to bring the traditions of ghost storytelling to the world, the way Mm -hmm. I grew up with it. Storytelling... Where I grew up was, it wasn't just something that you sat around the bonfire and told stories. Though we did that. We Mm -hmm. were very bored. We didn't have things like cities and stuff you do in cities. I don't Mm -hmm. know. I didn't know what that would have been when I was a kid. (laughs) (laughs) We had cow pastures and mountains and, you know, (laughs) 
<laughs> attractive. Eyes. So yes, eyes, lots of eyes. So, but we had storytelling. It's a very poverty stricken area. And so storytelling is a big form of entertainment. There's actually storytelling festivals. You can grow up and you can become a professional storyteller. You have a kid's birthday party. You hire a storyteller, not a magician. And so it's not just like getting around and telling stories like you would at a party. It's also like you would practice as if you were doing a soliloquy for a play. You would practice your pauses. You would practice the story. And it wasn't even so much the story itself that would make the story. It was the way you told it, the way you would engage with the audience. And I just absolutely fell in love with it and moved from East Tennessee to Chicago and could not find that anywhere. The closest Mm -hmm. thing I could find to that would be going to a jazz club. And I always say like jazz is a form of storytelling in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd be improvising and you'd have sort of the the give and take between the audience and the different jazz member players and things like that. But it wasn't, it wasn't an oral tradition. Mm -hmm. And so I... I guess I just had this hole inside, this hole inside (laughs) of me and I needed to fill it. And I tried so many things. I tried to be so many things. I was a graphic designer. I was a web developer. I was a professor. I was an art dealer. And none of those were really fulfilling. But then telling ghost stories was. And so here we are. Yes. And, uh, and I kind of dragged Diana into it, kicking and screaming. Actually, no, she, she, <laughs> she, she, she <laughs> I think it was like, Hey, Diana, I have this idea. Can you listen to this episode I did? And she responded with, no, that sucks. You need a co-host. Let's try it again with me. <laughs> <laughs> you did. The story gets more intense every time it's told. <laughs> just like the reg, just, just like the oral tradition of storytelling. Huh? <laughs> exactly. It can't be the same every time. <laughs> Because when it's the same, the story dies. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's okay. You're correct. I'm a horrible person. And I just kind of (laughs) interjected myself into Becky's podcast unbidden. So here I am. It all worked out. It was great. (laughs) It was great. I could not do it without her. She is, uh, because it really did suck without her. (laughs) Oh, dear. (laughs) What's the scariest episode we've had? Goodness. I mean, the hat man was pretty scary. The uh, a recent one with Michelle and the the drippy lady. That was pretty yes. scary. Yes. That one's been released. Yes. Okay. That was in season three. Mm. Yes. But that yeah, that, that was that that was chilling. Ugh. Yeah, basically this she she moved into a house and they didn't understand why all the pipes kept backing up and the sinks kept flooding. And they later learned that. Well, they, more than that, they had saw like wet footprints going up the carpeted stairs. Mm-hmm. And like the shower, like what? it would. Smell of chlorine. The water would get really yeah, cold like, and smell of chlorine. Ooh. It would be and, like swimming pool water coming out of the shower f- suddenly for no reason. And yeah, they discovered that previous owner, his wife, had had a stroke in the pool in the back. And he had been so distraught by it that. After her death, he, like, filled in the pool and moved out. Mm, You told me about that. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Yeah, and it it all culminates with with being smelled in your sleep. I'll leave it at that. Reading Rainbow Youth into listening to the episode (laughs) because I can't tell it anywhere near as as well as she can. Oh, yeah, she 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 did an absolute wonderful job telling it. So, yes, that's called What Do We Smell Like to Monsters? It's in season three. I'll have to link to that. <laughs> Although it makes also me kind of... Uh, yep. Oh, it's scary. <laughs> <laughs> Though, Lindsay, you will be coming on our show it, later in season four. And yeah. you have some very chilling stories as well, which is not going to say anything. People just have to watch out for that. Yep. I just can't wait to see the painting that comes out of Becky's head. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm excited. <sighs> I know. It was very fun being on your show. So, Oh, thank you. Yeah. Ghost stories are always scarier when they're told by the very people who experienced them. 
Hi, I'm Becky. And I'm Diana. And we're the hosts of the Homespun Haints podcast. We talk to people just like you who've come face to face with ghosts, demons, haints, and other strange paranormal phenomena. All of it makes for a chilling good time. So grab yourself a sweet tea, turn off the lights, and listen to some eerie true ghost stories on Homespun Haints, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm not scared. Are you? Well, are you ladies ready to try some Victorian slang terms? Oh, I we were born ready. ready. Yeah. Yes. All right. Becky, your Uh-oh. first term is Kruger spoof. Kruger spoof. You sure that's English? <laughs> sounds German. <laughs> it sounds very German. Yes. Uh, okay. Well, I would say then a Kruger spoof is when you impersonate royalty at a burlesque party and attempts to get in for free but then you are found out to be a fraud and but it actually works out in your favor because they can't arrest you because the operation that you went to visit is actually illegal I don't know (laughs) or either that or it's a type of noodle (laughs) does sound like noodles a little (laughs) I'm kind of like, well, what is it? Um, yeah, Spätzle. Or Spätzle. Kugel. Yep. <laughs> yes. Would you like some Kruger spoof? <laughs> Kruger spoof. Does that come with mozzarella? Covered in cheese <laughs> and beef. Mm. Mm. <laughs> you were kind of, it's, it's interesting because you were on kind of like the right thread because Ooh. it's a term from 1896 that means lying. Okay. So you were kind of just regular lying, just regular lying, ridiculously contrived lying about being royalty at a burlesque festival and narrowly avoiding arrest due to that lie. No, no. Due to the illicit nature of said lie. So, (laughs) yes. Mm. All right. Mm. Wow. Okay. So it just means lying. Just means lying. (laughs) Kruger spoof. It does sound very Teutonic. Mm -hmm. (laughs) All right. Diana, your first term is Gramercy. Gramercy. Hmm. So I'm thinking Gramercy probably has something to do with, uh, you know, a, a Victrola of some sort of phonograph. I'm thinking Gramercy is the ability to understand lyrics on a s- cylinder record, which really wasn't a common phenomenon. But, you know, when, when you actually can understand the lyrics recorded on the cylinder record like completely from front to back that's that's a feat of gramercy i love it i love it so much that's good (laughs) ah yes yes (laughs) this is ring around the (laughs) rosy my mother actually has an old victrola and i um I had her pick the kids up from school one day when they had like my my daughter had decided she wanted to bring her favorite album to school that day. And I come home and I hear Queen's Greatest Hits playing on the old Victrola. <laughs> it was so disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> my mom's like, I got it to work. And I'm like, I hope that's not destroying my record. <laughs> I'm sure that needle is not made for that. <laughs> yeah, was it a 78 RPM or how? I, so I don't know how she rigged it. There was probably some duct tape and screws and things <laughs> rearranged to make it. But oh, man. I thought that was your dad's side of the family <laughs> <laughs> that rigged things with duct tape. No, uh, I'm, I'm Southern through and through. There's duct tape mm. everywhere. That's Fair. true. <laughs> so Gramercy means thank you. Exactly like I said. Yep. Thank you. I'm really you got glad it. to be One, able to understand the lyrics. One thousand percent. I had I had about like growing up in this house in the basement, my dad repaired old phonographs and collected them. And so there were probably about fifteen of those in my basement That's growing awesome. up at any given time. Yeah. Oh, basement you is need to a play great time. Tits on them. Apparently. The basement is a great place to leave those because they don't really have like a volume control. Mm-hmm. So their only volume is, you know, barn stomping volume. 
in the, <laughs> in the whole building. <laughs> Too much? <laughs> Far less pleasant and more jarring than that. That uh, just reminds me of I have some 45s that I played on my parents' record player. And I didn't have it on the right setting. So it was just oh. like super low and terrifying sounding. <laughs> and I remember it was it was Strawberry Fields Forever by the Beatles. Oh, no. oh I've done the exact you same thing. Down. Down. God, so <laughs> yeah, I know. I did the exact same thing with the same album. That's oh, really? hilarious. <laughs> yes. No, I used to have a record player where it you could switch it back and forth from 33 yep. to 45 and yep. with a little up yep. in the center that yep. would change the size of the hole and you could play with the speeds as it went. But, yep. oh, that was my favorite listening to the Beatles. Oh, Extra oh yeah. I ruined my parents' <laughs> copy of Magical Mystery Tour trying to play it backwards. <laughs> I was like, I want to hear it. It says Paul is dead. And they kept no. it. What are you doing? Dark first pressing. Yeah. Oh, no. I was a bad kid. <laughs> Record players are so fun. Yeah, so they awesome. are. Mine is bright red. I'm very excited about it. Uh, <laughs> I have. My, I never had any gray or see, so. No. <laughs> Mine's not very polite. It doesn't thank me when I use it. Mm-hmm. Oh. So uh, proud. You need to play the records backwards. <laughs> That's how I'll get right. the thank you. <laughs> thank you, Paul is dead. <laughs> 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 All right, Oops. Becky. Your second <laughs> term is fly the kite. Oh, fly the kite. <laughs> it's not as literal as it might sound. <laughs> okay, so it has nothing to do with the Mary Poppins song. No. I think it does. All right. I I don't know why, but the first thing that popped into my head was that it's a euphemism for farting. And I'm probably completely wrong about that, but that's, that's just what popped into my head, so I'm going to go with it. <laughs> I think I actually know this one. <laughs> Fly the kite <laughs> is slang for to evacuate from a window. I didn't know. Oh, it. So it's, well, it's kind of the same thing. <laughs> so it's kind of like Mary Poppins and a fart. Like if you were to combine yes, the two. Exactly. <laughs> Just evacuating from a sphincter instead of a window. <laughs> exactly. I thought I thought that was called defenestration. <laughs> like the defenestration of Prague, where they push the guy out the window. Oh. This is slang. Yeah, well, defenestration is not slang. It is an American. Uh, it's easier to say fly the kite <laughs> than <laughs> defenestration. Defenestra- I, I thought I love that go word. fly a kite was like Victorian for go go f yourself. Oh, maybe adding go fly a kite instead of fly the kite. <laughs> yeah, go jump. Out maybe the it window. just means go jump out the window, and so yeah. it means the same thing in essence. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go fly the kite. What? <laughs> no. <laughs> now I'm just going to be thinking about that every time I hear, let's go fly the kite <laughs> to no. the highest height. Let's go fly the kite. Send it soaring. Right. She'll be yelling at the screen, step back from that ledge, my friend. <laughs> Don't fart as you jump out. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> don't fly the kite as you defenestrate <laughs> she evacuated her bowels as she flew the kite <laughs> well no that's not farting that's sharding I, yeah, it's that's like, true oh. <laughs> he's new we're meaning the contrails right yeah all right anyway all right so <laughs> Diana. sorry well, i'm ready your second term is churl. 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 C H U R L. Okay. I know this one. So, churl is to vomit into a butter churn <laughs> and then deny that you ever did anything. Ew. <laughs> Why is this butter so slippery? Oh, I can't get it to stay on my bed. Mommy. It's enzymes. It's cultured butter. It's fine. <laughs> Why does it, it taste, taste like beans? Like <laughs> Someone flew the kite in the butter. <laughs> Was a razor at the barn raising last night. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Churl 
is Victorian slang for peasant-like or coarse. Just like I said. I mean, what would you do if you were coarse <laughs> other than hide your sick in the park chair and deny it? It's pretty coarse. I mean, you've probably been drinking quite a bit, peasant. So it's <laughs> just a natural turn of events. That's very un Laura Ingalls Wilder of you to do that. I know. <laughs> Well, she was churl enough as it was. <laughs> she was. <laughs> true. This is true. You're not wrong. <laughs> oh, I love it. I, you know, I've actually seen that word so often in texts, and I had no idea what it meant. I thought it meant like a nasty child. So I guess I've been schooled. Oh, you have been schooled. Kind of. Yeah. Nasty But I love Diana's child. Yeah. Of course. I love yeah. Diana's description. I'm going to look at butter churns completely differently now. Yep. From here on out. Check for lumps. <laughs> I'm also going to look at windows very differently now. <laughs> 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 and gramophones, I guess, as well. <laughs> <laughs> and a good day to you, sir. <laughs> Thanks for all the memories. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Let me take you down. <laughs> down. <laughs> oh, so much fun. <laughs> I know. Well, I would like to thank Becky and Diana for joining me today for Can You Crack the Cramp Word? And before we go, can you please tell our listeners where they can find you on social, on podcasting platforms, Everything all that fun stuff? <laughs> Well, we're on We Are Homespun Haints, and it's pretty easy to remember. Haints is spelled H-A-I-N-T-S, and it is an old, old term, meaning a nasty spirit you don't want in your house. Mm -hmm. And we're everywhere. Our website is homespunhaints.com. You can find our podcast on any pod chaser, where pod chaser, any <laughs> pod catcher. Don't go chasing waterfalls. Any pod catcher. And we are also um, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Pinterest at Homespun Haints. We also have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Homespun Haints. So anywhere you type in Homespun Haints, you will probably find us. It is true. I Googled it <laughs> and they're right. Sweet. <laughs> was the first thing that popped up. Well, and good. thank you for having us on the show so much, yes. Lindsay. It's been a blast. I would do this every night if you asked me to. <laughs> yes, I've been so, so entertained. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so fun to like hear everybody's random thoughts on what these things mean. And I swear, I swear to you, they all sound so much better than what the term actually means. Every right? time. Every time. That's all I've learned is that Lying. is that uh <laughs> Kruger spoof sounds more like a, a paste a pasta dish than lying. It's all lies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay, and I'll see you next time with another tale as old as crime.